remember a time when we didn't have prayer like this in our, in our service. Um, and I remember just thinking of the process that it took to, among our elders for us to discuss why would we pray in the service, how ought we to pray, and being encouraged um, on, on how that ought to be for your care and a reflection, as I've told you many times, how we have been praying for you since we left the gathering on the Lord's Day morning to the next morning of being together in the next prayer. And so that is my prayer for you, that you would be encouraged um, by such prayers of your pastors. Um, let's go to the word now in Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, we covered the first six verses of this chapter last week. And we had learned that Moses was the great servant in God's house. And I think that emphasis is quite important. Uh, but Jesus is the faithful son of God over God's house. He is its head. He is the cornerstone we learned last week. And the preacher of Hebrews had concluded by saying that we together are that house. We are the house of God. We are the people of God by faith. Uh, but we also concluded with a warning. Uh, the writer of Hebrews seems to continually give us these exhortations, these encouragements, but also warnings without hesitation. It was a call to perseverance in genuine faith. As we found in verse 6, the writer had called us to consider with a very great seriousness and self-examination that we are Christ's house, but only if, if we hold fast our confidence and our boast of our hope firm until the end. If you have an NASB, that is the phrase at the end there, firm until the end. And that's what defines the spiritual people of God in Christ. They persevere, they continue on. And so the warning in the book of Hebrews are a call to examine ourselves and our doctrine, our belief, our, our profession of faith, we could say. That we might not presume that we are Christians simply because we find ourselves in a church service this morning or in a local building, or even if maybe we have convinced those around us enough by getting into the membership of the local church. But again, to capture the focus of this section, we find from the headers in the ESV, it says, rest for the people of God. And the CSB header tells us this is a warning against unbelief. And so really in this section of chapter 3, which is going to continue on to chapter 4, we find the promise and the pattern of rest and the problem of rebellion and unbelief. And so as we come to this section, quite a longer section, we'll cover verse 7 through 19, the preacher of Hebrews is warning us that we should consider and remember the unbelief of those in the history of of God's work. And so just as we had seen in the comparison between Moses the servant and Jesus Christ the son, in verses 7 through 19, we will find the comparison between their peoples, the unbelief of the outward national people and the call of the genuine believing inward spiritual people of God. And so we're going to read together in Hebrews chapter 3 starting in verse Seven, And so hear the word of our great God. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion 
For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did, the, did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And may God bless his word as we read it now and apply it to our lives and our hearts. As we come to a passage like this, we're reminded, I think, how important it is to know the Old Testament and the redemptive plan of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, Again, I think it's often that when we have discussions, we may forget that when we come to a passage like Hebrews 3 and onward, there's much that has been said and that is being drawn upon from the old covenants. Uh, Again, this is often something Christians forget. I, I even remember hearing a discussion about Christian discipleship where one of the pastors had said the two things which seem most neglected in Christian discipleship today is a biblical understanding of the church and a basic knowledge of church history. And I think we see evidence of this problem today. Many claim to be Christian. Many claim we hear the phrase mature. That is a mature Christian. And yet, when we look upon their lives, they neglect the study of theology. They neglect the study of history, both biblical history and church history, and they neglect the subject of redemption. And so we're encouraged here as we come to Hebrews 3 to remember a negative outcome of the past that we may really, again, it's for us to think rightly and biblically about listening to and resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, as we just read verse 7 through 9, the writer says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Now, again, I told you I have no issue belaboring the point of what the therefore is there for. In fact, again, the therefore connects back to the warning of verse 6. And the preacher of Hebrews is telling us that the Holy Spirit is both the interpreter and the authoritative messenger of this Old Testament warning. Now again, verses 7 through 11 in our exposition are drawn from Psalm 95. Uh, Again, back in July, we had spent uh, one Sunday covering this psalm in an exposition. And we found in summary that Psalm 95 had within it the call to genuine worship and the command to wholehearted obedience. Again, as David urged his congregation, the first congregation and the recipients of Psalm 95, he encouraged them that we ought to look and listen to the word of the living God. And from that, as we listen and we look upon the word of, the God, of, the word of God, we're to respond to the invitations and the warnings that had been even given to the previous generation. Again, We found in our call to worship that Psalm 95 has within it an incredible invitation. In verse 1 through 3 that we read, David writes, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. And again, down in verse 6 and 7 of Psalm 95, we we found the the posture of genuine worship. Uh, David writes, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us come humbly. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Again, this is the genuine call to humbly come before the Lord in genuine, wholehearted worship. But again, there's equally a caution to those who would come 
to worship the Lord. In fact, in turning to the last half of the psalm, which is what Hebrews 3 is directly citing, David is cautioning his own generation against heartless, hardened worship. And he's pointing them to wholehearted worship that looks forward to God's rest. And notice at the end of verse 7, and also verse 8 and 10, if you've already turned to Psalm 95, David says to the congregation, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Now again, understand, as we had covered in, in our study of Psalm 95, to hear the Lord's voice was not only to listen, but also to obey. And so as we hear the truth of the gospel today, we hear the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ, we hear the richness of all the benefits and the blessings that are found in Christ, and even our great need for him. We're not to turn away. If we hear his voice, we ought not turn away and plug our ears. We are to hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. But we're to hear the gospel and obey to listen intently and follow Christ wholeheartedly. Again, among the many reasons that the writer of Hebrews is citing Psalm 95, it seems that the preacher is drawing upon this citation in Israel's history to remind his own audience about the outcome of those who do not listen and obey the Lord. Again, from generation to generation, that is the warning and the call. That in hearing the Lord's voice, we are not only to listen, but to obey. And so just as David said in Psalm 95, the writer of Hebrews also wants to convey in chapter 3 the very sobering warning. If you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your hearts. Again, remember that the first congregation of, uh, of the book of Hebrews, those who are receiving this exposition, are those Jewish Christians that were likely tempted to go back to the old ways, to the old covenants. It's in a sense as though they're saying, we hear the voice of the Lord, we, we, we see the ministry and the benefits of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we also face great persecution, we face great difficulty and so what if we simply just go back? What was wrong with Moses? But again, this is why the preacher of Hebrews wants our minds to be on the example of old. Again, David's pointing out in Psalm 95 concerning the warning and the outcome of an unbelieving, hardened heart. Again, when Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 is citing Psalm 95, we are pointed back very intentionally to Israel's history under Moses. Again, thus we're told in, in the warning against hardening our hearts that we're not to respond, as the psalmist says, as in the rebellion on, in, on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Again, the, the writer of Hebrews, the preacher, is simply paraphrasing uh, and saying, this is in the rebellion. This is on the day of testing in the wilderness. But if we go back to Psalm 95, in verse 8 and 9, the psalmist provides the historical context. In verse 8 and 9 of Psalm 95, David writes, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. <clears throat> now see, when the psalmist here mentions Meribah and Massa, he is deliberately pointing us back to Exodus chapter 17. Because there we find the example and the hardened hearts of those who did not genuinely worship the Lord for his redemptive and rescuing work. Rather, we find they complained. They tested God and they rejected God. Again, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 2, we find that the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. 
And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? And even further down in verse 6 and 7 of Exodus 17, there we read, Behold, the Lord said, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Again, church, here we come to the heart of the issue. And it is the issue of man's heart to not trust the Lord, to not love the Lord, and to not seek the Lord in his rebellion. Again, notice God's response in verse 10. The writer of Hebrews is citing Psalm 95 verse 10 saying, Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Now again, Israel's rebellion there in Exodus chapter 17 was not due to a moment of thirst or fatigue. It was due to a constant attitude and posture of their hearts toward the Lord. And even though they had seen the wonderful works of God for 40 years, the writer tells us, they tested God and they rebelled against his commands. And in this, it became absolutely clear. They did not actually love and obey God. Again, this showed that while being externally of Israel under the old covenant, both the psalmist and the preacher in Hebrews reminds us here what God had said. And that is that when they go astray in their hearts, it is showing, it's proving to us they have not known his ways. They have not believed upon his ways. Again, this whole passage in Hebrews 3 is focused on the warning of unbelief. And so this is what is made clear in considering Israel in the wilderness. That that generation had unbelieving hearts. Again, God had continually revealed his saving work to Israel, showing them his desire for mercy. And yet, despite seeing God's ways, they did not know God. In other words, when the going got tough, the truth revealed they had never truly listened and looked to him. They had never truly known him. This is why in verse 11 of our passage, again, we find a citation of Psalm 95, verse 11, where the Lord had said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now again, the full context of this oath of which God makes is seen in Numbers chapter 14. And I would encourage you to go back later today and read all of Numbers chapter 14. But we find in the middle of that chapter, in verse 28 through 30 of Numbers 14, the Lord had said, Say to that wicked generation, As I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And of all your number, listed in the consensus from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Now understand, in this, God had sworn an oath. And how Dane in his notes points out in this comment that God had told to unbelieving Israel, if they had entered into his rest in unbelief, he is not God. That is the seriousness of the oath. So we ought to ask, what is God's rest? Why is this so important? Well, again, throughout the scriptures, Throughout the Old and the New Testament, we're told that God's rest is first a reference to a creation ordinance in Genesis chapter 2. And we know quite simply in the first few chapters of Genesis, God created and then he rested. 
And when God had rested, he rested after finishing his work of creation. But again, we know if we go back to those few chapters of Genesis, that rest was lost in its perfect sense. It was lost for man to enter when Adam sinned. And because we are in Adam by nature, no longer would the fallen man love and obey God with all he is. His heart from that point forward was radically stained and affected by sin. And so never again since the fall in the garden could man enter God's rest in the way in which he created it to be entered. He could not enter by his own work. In fact, he remained restless by an irreconcilable brokenness. And so just like the wicked and restless generation in Exodus 17 and Numbers chapter 14, apart from trusting in the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, we too are a people who go astray in our hearts and we do not know the way of the Lord. Again, this is why as we come now to verses 12 through 15, the preacher in Hebrews turns to us. He says in verse 12, take heart or take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Quite a serious reminder and exhortation. Now in this, I often think about how many have sat in this sanctuary and they've come to this church for a time. They've heard the word of God preached and proclaimed. Some have, have even said, we are here because the preaching is biblical. They will see that. They will say that. And yet in the end, it becomes very evident in their attitude and in their response to the call to listen and to look to and to trust in Christ they were actually those who had an evil, unbelieving heart. Now again, that's quite difficult to deal with. And please understand, there are some who have gone out from here for good reason. Moving away or not being part of this local church doesn't make someone a non-believer. That's not the point. But there are those who have come here and seem to show some kind of sign of belief. But over time... And through the evidence of their lack of faith, it shows they were never truly a believer. And so again, I'm not saying if you go elsewhere, it shows you're not a true believer. But what I am absolutely saying, what we find in the scriptures, is that there are many who will claim to believe. And they will have all sorts of experiences and references and resources to prove their point. And yet when we look at the heart of the issue... The warning here in Hebrews 3 reminds us the issue is an unbelieving heart. Again, even Israel was continually shown the way of God. They, they still even did not know and trust God. And so the warning and the caution to us here is that an unbelieving heart can experience the, the ordinary means of grace. And absolutely can in the local church. An unbelieving heart can experience the word preached, the prayers of pastors and saints. It can, it can experience the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper and still will fall away. Why? Because an unbelieving heart may give an accurate and outward profession, but it will never be a true inward confession of a changed heart. Again, I think it's worth mentioning here that some would take this passage to mean you can lose your salvation. And there have been countless discussions and throughout the ages there have been conversations, some I think which more produce a lot of heat and some which produce a little bit of light. Again, even our three-year study of the Gospel of John caused us to have to work through and wrestle through some of these things. But here, while I'm not going to take an an a massive amount of time to, to discuss this, I think there are some things to be said as we approach a passage such as this. One, there is not a single passage of the Bible which we should ever be afraid to wrestle with and sit under. We should not be easily offended when we disagree. 
so long as we are willing to open and sit under the scriptures. And we ought to be humble in our disagreements because while there is one right interpretation of the scriptures, the arrogance of man has never produced one ounce of clarity. And so we ought not to come to one another with created position papers, but with humble hearts willing to sit under the scriptures. Now again, as we come to this passage, I believe the writer of Hebrews is teaching us that genuine believers persevere by inward regeneration, but that false believers fall away because of inward rebellion. Again, it's no contradiction or assumption upon the word of God to believe that the Christian's assurance and responsibility harmonize in the New Testament. Again, I think it's because of this that the apostles gladly tell us, as in Ephesians 1, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, From the beginning God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. And in Philippians 1.6, Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And also at the same time without contradiction, we find such truths in the New Testament as in Luke chapter 13 verse 3. And in verse 5, where Jesus had said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus had said in John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice. And I think that ought to tip us off to a connection to our passage. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And the Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 1.10, Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And finally, in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. None of these passages of Scripture, nothing in all of Scripture can, confronts us, c provides for us conflicting theology in itself. Rather, I think we are shown here throughout the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us the perseverance of the saints and the preservation of God in the lives of whom He has chosen. But again, is there a very real warning in this passage to not fall away. Yes, absolutely. This is an exhortation and a call to stand firm to genuine belief by clinging to the hope of Christ and persevering to the end. Again, consider also that in the Gospel of John, we're continually reminded that there exists a type of external belief which looks, but it does not see. It hears, but it does not listen. And it believes, but it does not trust. Again, John writes for us at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 2, in verse 23 through 25, we're told, Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And only just a few verses later in John 3, verse 3, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Again, I think in the Gospel of John, we find this continued comparison and contrast. That there is a type of external belief which does not persevere and God does not preserve. But genuine belief, belief which perseveres to the end, is rooted in the grace and preservation of God. Now again, the writer wants to be clear. 
No one in any local church is exempt from the warning. And so all who hear the warning must guard their heart and be watchful. Why? So that their hearts do not turn towards evil. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 tells us, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Again, that's even the warning we hear given first to the previous generation. And so the preacher here in Hebrews chapter 3 provides us with important application. I think both in examining our own hearts and exhorting one another towards genuine belief. Look at verse 13 in your Bibles where he says, Exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now again, when we consider the deceitfulness of sin and the pull of this world upon our hearts, we're reminded in the scriptures that hardening in our hearts has a very dangerous and damning outcome for those who go off into that deceitfulness of sin. Again, even in Isaiah chapter 44, God describes the one who has gone off into idolatry. In verse 20, he says, He feeds on ashes. He deceive, his deceived mind has led him astray. And he cannot rescue himself or say, Isn't there a lie in my right hand? His conscience is seared. He's been given over to the deceitfulness of sin. And so again, in light of this, and this very real problem, in our exhortation to one another against these things, we ought to remember we are to be pointing our brothers and sisters to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to encourage and we're to exhort one another to hold firm to the faith and not shrink back from the family of God. Again, later in chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews will tell us in verse 23 through 25, Hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, church, to put it simply, we ought to greatly value the gathering of the saints. The fellowship of believers. Again, have you ever heard often people, we use the phrase, I'm the church. And really what they mean in that is not an identifying with the whole body of Christ. They mean it's just me and Jesus. They isolate themselves and they give in to what is a very worldly understanding of the individualism of man. And yet in the scriptures, we're told we're a body. We are a building. We are the household of God. And thus it means our commitment level should not be upon which we pick and choose during the week. But the gathering of the saints on the Lord's day and the fellowship of believers among us ought to be the most important priority in all of our life. It ought to be worth risking other friendships other unbelieving family, even our jobs to prioritize and to value the believers that God has placed in our life in the local church. And why? Because these are the believers who have committed themselves to exhort us, to encourage us that we would not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. They have committed to us and we ought to commit to them to exhort one another when one is absent, to care for those when they are down, to warn those when they are deceived by sin and to lift them up when they stumble. Again, the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, church, the warning here in our text 
is not simply that we ourselves would sit here and make sure that we endure, but also that we would exhort one another in enduring every day. Again, notice what the preacher says in verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Now again, those who hold their original confidence firm to the end and who persevere in the faith, they are those who share in Christ. Again, like we examined last week, there are many who lean against the people of God. They want the benefits of the local church, but ultimately they do not share in Christ. And this is why we were told back in verse 6, we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Again, here in chapter 3, the, fa- the phrase, our original confidence, is a reference to our confession of faith. That time when we professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we repented and we believed genuinely upon the Lord. But many of us may recall that time, that time of our profession. And we may even recall how zealous we were in the beginning for faith. How much we loved to listen to preaching. Now we, now we may ask, what, what, when, when was that? We remember maybe a time when we were passionate about the reading of God's word, the singing of the songs of redemption that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and the prioritizing from our finances to our focus in the local church. But again, what tends to happen over time is in the trials of life and the deceitfulness of sin, sometimes we are overcome by our grief and our pain and our anxieties, and our troubles, and our brokenness, and it causes us to not look upon Christ, but look upon earthly things. And what happens when we look upon earthly things and not heavenly things? We grow further in our deceitfulness of sin. And so this is where the writer of Hebrews is telling us, hold your original confidence firm to the end. That time where it was, it was the most important thing to be with the Lord in prayer and study of his word, where you could not imagine a Sunday you would miss, he would say, hold firm your original confidence, firm to the end. Set your mind on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Devote yourself all the more to the study of God's word, to the gathering of his people on the Lord's day and ask the Lord to help you believe and endure to the end. Again, and take heart. As Jesus had told his disciples in John 16, in me, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Again, the Apostle John picks up on this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. And he says, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to exhort one another we may avoid the deceitfulness of sin, the trials and the tribulations of this world. And it doesn't mean that we won't go through them. It simply means we will not be overcome by them. Again, while many say today with great claim that they are Christian, we often see in their life that there is zero to little evidence of that. And so we ought to consider the warning in the hope that we do not harden ourselves and become deceitful in our trials, in our temptations, but rather that we would pray and ask the Lord to preserve our faith in Christ as we persevere in him. Again, notice in verse 15 that the preacher of Hebrews is continuing and even going back to Psalm 95, a repeated citation we find in chapters 3 and 4. As the writer says, today if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Again, the warning and the exhortation here is that if you have heard God's voice and the instruction of the Lord in the gospel today, then we ought to look and listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to listen to him and look to him and trust in him rather than hardening our hearts and walking away from even what we maybe even claimed once to obey and love and believe just like the generations of old. Again, notice how the writer of Hebrews shows us this in the following verses. Again, we're reminded about the seriousness of the warning when he says in verse 16 through 18, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom has the Lord provoked? Was the Lord provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did the Lord swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Again, I think it may be difficult for us in this time to wrap our minds around the extent of the rebellion and the disobedience of the people of Israel. But again, at the heart of the issue, we find they did not listen and obey God. They did not trust in the promises of God. And again, the Old Testament is helpful here to us. I think Deuteronomy chapter 1 specifically is helpful in understanding this issue. And Moses writes in verse 26 through 33 in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, Do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night and in cloud by day to show you by what way you should go. Again, friends, this is an example of hardened hearts which have turned away from the Lord in unbelief. Again, the writer tells us at the end of chapter 3 in verse 19. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is why Moses says down in verse 34 through 36 of Deuteronomy chapter 1, the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore, Not one of these men of this evil generation shall see, shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb and except Joshua. Now again, <clears throat> remember the context and the subject of what we have been dealing with here in chapter 3, and even where the writer began. Specifically, we considered verse 6, how Moses was faithful in the house of God. And he proclaimed the truth of the one to come. And we found that Moses' ministry was both to the offspring of Abraham according to the flesh and the offspring of Abraham according to the faith. But Jesus, the apostle and high priest, our apostle and high priest, is the son of who is over the house of God. He has come to save and to restore the spiritual offspring of Abraham according to the faith. And so Jesus' ministry, as we're reminded, is superior to Moses because the son has a better message. 
He has a people who will hear and listen to his voice. He is the mediator of a better covenant and the rest he offers, which is found in himself, is the rest that is found in our risen and reigning king. And so by faith, we trust in the promise and faithfulness of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are looking forward to a better heavenly land, a better rest. Again, as we have learned, the promise of God's rest was never given to unbelieving people. But all those who come to Christ, who listen and obey him, they find rest in him. And so this is why in chapter 4, we will see that as the writer of Hebrews tells us down in verse 3, for we who have believed enter that rest. And again, I would encourage you as we close to consider from the mouth of Jesus what he says as an invitation. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus has come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, Jesus says in the very next passage that he is Lord of the Sabbath, meaning Jesus is Lord over the day of rest. Again, throughout the scriptures, we find that God has promised this rest in a weekly pattern and in an eschatological promise. And so friends, as the writer of Hebrews will continually call us to consider with soberness these realities, both the warnings and the promise of rest found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Brothers and sisters, let us take to heart the warning against false worship that we would genuinely look and we would listen to Christ and that we may wholeheartedly come to him in genuine faith and be reminded on this Lord's day that after our Lord had finished his rest of creating us as new creation in Christ, he sat down at the right hand of the Father entering the rest that had never been entered before the fall. And we have been given that rest, both in a pattern of the Lord's day and the promise of our eschatological rest in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that as we are called to believe upon these promises, as we are called to trust in our Savior, that we are reminded that rest is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Lord, may you remind us that that as we come to this first day of the week, that we begin with rest in the Lord Jesus Christ and being reminded of that in this day of rest with the people of God. And so, Lord... As the psalmist says in Psalm 139, may you search our hearts and know us. May you point out in in us anything that offends you and point us in your way everlasting. Lord, may you teach us and remind us to look upon Christ, to run from the deceitfulness of sin, and that as we hear your voice, we would trust upon you and look and listen to Christ and Christ alone. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.